Hey everybody, how you doing? <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremy Huxley, as it shows. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 13 years, six and a half at Naughty Dog. It's quite a bit. Um, I'm just going to be talking about how we sort of, a few of us on the art team started developing the look for Uncharted 4's uh, jungles. And, okay, so... In early 2012, uh, Adam Littledale, he's a model I've worked with a lot, and myself, I'm a shader and texture artist. Um, we were tasked with exploring what jungles could look like on the next generation of systems. So we started focusing on color materials. We tried to define what our own expectations would be for a new Uncharted. Um, in doing so, we learned what excited us about uh, our own style, um, in our minds, the Uncharted style is sort of deliberately vibrant and illustrative. Uh, it goes heavy on details that matter, um, while hopefully not getting too noisy. A lot of artists, including myself, look to a lot of traditional painters um, for inspiration on shape, color, and material response. I think some of these are Caravaggio's. Um, we experimented with detail density, materials, composition, and readability. Uh, there weren't really any guidelines. There was no, nothing to look to at the time. We were sort of making it up as we went. Uh, we sort of threw everything in there. It could be kind of a bit of a mess sometimes. Uh, here's an example of one of the early tests um, for the PS4. Okay, um, while creating my materials and palettes, I was heavily influenced by uh, Studio Ghibli. And I think the artist's name specifically for these pieces are, is uh, Oga Kazuo. I'm not sure if I'm uh, mutilating that name, but he's an amazing artist. It was a huge inspiration for me personally. Um, we wanted our shaders to appear realistic at a glance and more handcrafted and painterly up close. Uh, we tried using realistic plants and trees, but they didn't really fit in our game. Um, through the interplay between smooth and rough surfaces, we could define materials with sort of a more rich, rich uh, and interesting style. Um, here's some examples of some of my work. Uh, it's hand painted in ZBrush and Photoshop. So on the left, the gray mesh in ZBrush, just painting the color in in ZBrush and then just sort of shaded in ZBrush. So here's some examples of some of my shaders. Uh, it took moss, leaves, stone, uh, mud, and bark to realize the jungles, and the surfaces needed to be rich in detail and vibrant. So just a couple shaders I did for the game. So by creating this vertical slice, we were able to learn what we liked and what we didn't. Uh, with what we had already created. For example, this image is way too noisy overall, but aspects, aspects of it are working. Uh, the balance of noise and areas of rest near the statue are working. The light is more focused, and the contrast of rough and smooth surfaces really help to sell the materials. Uh, we use this as a testing ground for a lot of the technology, uh, like fuzz, uh, subsurface scattering, translucency, and even depth of field. Um, despite the problems, we were starting to find the Uncharted style. So most of our assets used in previous tests, including the, the last one, were later recreated and organized into a library by our, our technical artists, um, uh, which other teams could use to, to populate the game. So a true test for our library was our first public teaser for E3, uh, which we accomplished using what we had learned and created thus far. Here's like a little cut of it. I think you might, some of you might have seen Back it. So can I count on you? One last time. All right, kid. Let's go do it. One last time. Um, 
So the following are just a few screenshots showing the fruits of our labors. Uh, these are levels that Adam, Adam Whittledale and myself worked on. He's the model I worked with a lot, uh, which represent a few of the jungles that we created, but it only represents a, a few that made it in the final game. Um, it's just a couple different screenshots. So uh, that's pretty much the end of my speech. Uh, I'd like to thank Noman and Andrew for setting this up, um, Naughty Dog for letting us do this, all the amazing artists at Naughty Dog. It's a, truly a team effort. And despite whoever starts a project, I would say the whole team ends up finishing it. So thank you very much. Uh, and here's some of my contact info. Thank you. I'm Brian Beppu. I'm Ruben Shaw. And today we're sharing with you Passing Time, a look into Avery's Descent and the City Clock Tower. These are two levels Ruben and I worked on together for Uncharted 4. Um, we had just finished working on The Last of Us Left Behind, and a lot of work for Uncharted had been started, as we just saw in Jeremy's presentation. These two levels are very different from each other, so they presented their own unique challenges and rewards giving us a good chance to just kind of stretch our wings a little bit while working on one game. Two opposites, if you will. Um, here's Avery's Descent, internally known as Passage. Um, Passage was an interesting level for Naughty Dog in terms of lighting and the scope. Um, we chose to go very uh, tight corridors, uh, single light source, uh, which is a real-time light, um, through these uh, dark, uh, cavernous uh, caves. Um, we had uh, four unique looks. Right here we have uh, some concept art by John Sweeney um, showing the contrast and uh, the mood that we were going for. It's a dead man's party. Who could ask for more? <laughs> boingo, boingo, anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Um, passage was littered with uh, tons of effigies, skeletons, and mummies that showed uh, Avery's madness. Uh, during this time, Avery was going a little crazy. Avery's descent was a level that was supposed to show how far off the deep end Avery had gone. By this point in the game, you were starting to see some of that show up. He was mentally unstable and even more dangerous, especially to those closest to him. We tried to convey that with the art, starting with fairly sound structural elements that slowly decay away and show this madness. Perfect, per perfect group to do Avery's, Avery's craziness. Us sure, too, right? sure, yeah. <laughs> These are some of the assets that we use for the structured tunnels. Um, having a single light source uh, uh, showed off a couple problems that we were having. As there was no real light bake to any of our levels, uh, we had to um, accentuate a lot of the modeling and shaders um, to get things to read correctly. Um, anyway, these are some of the assets that we used for the bricked structure tunnels. Using these assets, we were able to co um, combine, uh, combine the assets to create uh, very fast layouts. Uh, design was changing quite a bit to find the right um, gameplay and production for the scope of passage. Uh, we had to uh, work pretty modular to go, to go with the flow. This is uh, the level with the flashlight in action. Uh, Gabe Betancourt was our lighting artist. Um, we worked with him to define our look and style, as you can see here. That's a single light source um, emanating from Drake himself. Yeah, the textures for Passage had to convey a worn down, musty area with a lot of water damage. And I found I needed to push the colors beyond a standard traditional look for it to be noticeable because it just didn't seem to pop out the way we wanted it. But we you know, still wanted to control that and not get too colorful and cartoony with it. 
Um, our flashlight tech took a huge upgrade from The Last of Us in terms of throw, bounce, and spill, um, as seen in, these, uh, in this video right here. Um, we also, as we dove deeper into the tunnels, we uh, switched light sources again from a flashlight to a torch. Um, this organic environment led to um, certain challenges that we needed to, to adhere to. Um, uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment Europe shared a tessellation plugin with us that we were able to use during production that allowed us to use a height map and a lower res cage to um, export out some tessellated mesh. Um, this is all um, baked out and not runtime. Um, anyway, this helped us uh, Get, um, get our level of detail um, that we needed really quickly that Naughty Dog games are expected to have. Um, here's some more examples. Yeah, this is a good example of creating our own library of assets that we could quickly build out for the natural environment, you know, allowing us to focus on the slower story-driven sections that this level was littered with and kind of give it the love that it needed and not get bogged down with the sort of building of the level process. Absolutely. There's a lot of story elements here, so we had to pay attention to that, so that, that helped us uh, focus on that. Um, the torch added a great complexity to our look um, with a lot of high contrast moments, um, and since both, both players had the torch, uh, we had to actually script intensities as they got closer. We had to kind of tone it down or else it was blowing, blowing things out. And because of the different lighting looks coming up with the materials and textures, required a lot of adjusting and fine tuning. Everything had to look good under all these different lighting situations and not, not stick out. You know, every time I we would get something looking pretty good, and then the torch would look weird or the flashlight look, would, would look weird. Again, some more uh, torch images right here. Or, yep. and here's a torch in action. Uh, don't worry about this mummy. This mummy does not blow up. All the mummies that blow up in Passage are all because of Quinn Kazumaki, who is a Nomen student. Is Quinn here? <laughs> Can we get a round of applause for Quinn? <laughs> he was invaluable in getting all these things set up and working correctly for us. So thanks again, buddy. This level came together pretty fast, didn't it? It did, yeah. It had to, yeah. <laughs> um, the look changed once again when our heroes encountered some uh, flares. Yeah, eventually Drake and Elena encounter enemies like they always do. And these guys happen to be carrying flares, gave, a, gave them a chance to lose the torches, pick up the flares, and let us, as the environment artists, have a little bit more fun and challenge. You know, it's not a huge take on, a different take on it, but it does create a, a, another set of problems. And luckily, the flow that we had started in terms of making the materials and the assets let us, it, it made it a little easier, basically. Some more uh, flare tunnel looks. And here's the flare in action. So uh, one thing that we wanted to, we tried was using a more traditional um, red magenta flare, and it just wasn't really looking looking right. So we looked at uh, some film, some some film reference to get this blue green look, and we think it uh, fit the theme a little bit better. Pass the end of passage actually had another lighting situation being lit by the sun. Yeah, the sunlit area ended up being. A bit of a challenge on its own because it, for me at least, it always acted as a guide that as far as we were trying to push certain areas, this area still had to be representative and natural looking. So every, every once in a while you'd go too far and you'd have to check, well, how does the end look and kind of kept us in check. So we're going to move on from passage to hidden in plain sight, the clock tower. Uh, the clock tower was uh, very different than passage as it was huge. Here's some of the concept art for the clock tower. The concept was done by Nick's, uh, Nick Jindrow. Um, he did an awesome job here. Um, one thing to note that we couldn't actually use as much of the structure that, that, that's shown here for gameplay. Yeah, the overall look of this level was one of the earliest glimpses into the Avery style that we would see a lot more later throughout the game. While we still wanted this area to be grand in, in scale and ornate, some of the flourishes and details were more subdued and purposely held back because we would see a lot more of it later and we kind of wanted to save 
save that reveal for some of the later levels. That is one thing, being an artist at Naughty Dog, you have to be ready for everything. <laughs> Whether it be dark, dark tunnels or epic big uh, clock towers. The, uh, the tower itself was a big traversal set piece. Yeah. Um, we had to interact quite a bit with uh, foreground animation and effects to get everything to work correctly. Readability was pretty key. Uh, these are some of the assets that we used for, oh, whoops. We, these are some of the assets that we used for tower, um, mainly based on colonial and Roman styling that Avery was a fan of. Um, and it also lent to the, the lavishness that uh, was indicative of the level. Uh, this look also appears later in games. I think you used some of that stuff in open water. <laughs> I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, the scale of the clock tower is pretty huge. Can you guys find Drake in this image? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah, the big challenge for this environment was showing what could and couldn't be climbed by Drake, making all the climbable edges readable but not too obvious for the player. Again, visual language is really important. Where the player could go, where the player could jump to, et cetera, was very, very key. Yeah, and then throughout the level, we would see these zodiac symbols, and they helped as guides throughout the level for the player that when you had to traverse up and down the tower. Similar to the traversal solutions, there needed to be a clear and readable guide, but not at the expense of the environment. There was a lot of playing with the scale and the color and the materi materials to achieve this. Anyway, uh, what time is it? It's time to break the whole clock tower. So <laughs> join us in this video. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, Sally. Oh, shit. At least I got the door open, though, huh? <laughs> That's one way to do it. And in typical Uncharted fashion, it reveals the secret staircase to the puzzle room. Um, this level was pretty intense with uh, how much interaction with foreground and animation was going on. A lot of things were uh, hand-animated, simmed, and... Um, keyframed to, to, I don't even know what degree, but it was pretty crazy. Um, anyway, that's all, folks. If you guys have any questions or comments, more are welcome. Matt, Brian Beppu, Ruben Shaw, you can follow, follow our art station pages on Twitter. You <laughs> get did we have any questions before we change to the next speakers? This will be your chance to ask these guys questions. So <laughs> we have one here. You guys were talking about the info. Oh, oh, yeah. You guys were talking about using um, colonial and Roman influences within the game. Uh, do you guys travel to these places, or do you just like you know Google them or something? We do a little bit of both, you know. Some of us do travel. Uh, some of us do Google Earth it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, Google does lend us a fair amount of uh, reference that we can use to extrapolate on this. But, you know, both Brian and I have been places that might have that type of architecture. Yeah, it's whether you know it or not, you're researching all the time. And for this level specifically, you know, obviously the concept artists handle a lot of that and get that ball rolling. And they... They're well versed and they know, you know, how to actually approach some of these problems. And then, you know, it's up to us to work with them and kind of take that and kind of go with the flow. And it, it's that's kind of the, the process usually for something like that. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. No worries. Any other takers? Oh, okay. It might take me a while to get there. <laughs> Hi, 
So I, I heard you guys had a lot of variations you had to do with the shaders on the tunnels, um, but I thought we were in this magical world of PBR where you just slap it on and it works in everything perfectly. So it doesn't sound like that's the case. Can you elaborate? Uh, I, I don't know if I want to elaborate that far in terms of whether it, you can slap it in. I think that's always the ideal, and that's a, you know you kind of want to adhere to that as a base. But I think specifically with this level, I almost found like it kind of went back to more of like a, a an old school feel, at least for me, of just more of an emotion or kind of what felt right. And then a lot of times you would play with play in the level, and some of the tech wasn't quite there yet. You know, our lighting artist would be getting that online, and finally when he had that online, we'd have to kind of push and pull and get those things working together. And it, I think some of the colors that I had to use kind of went further than, than normal, just because like whether I was subconsciously doing this or not, I was influenced with certain things like Sleeping Beauty, for example, like some of the colors of the way the castle was set up. I didn't, don't think I was doing that on purpose, but after the fact, I would look back and I'm like, that's kind of cool, you know, for me at least, and hopefully it worked in the game. Also remember the uh, passage had a very unique lighting situation compared to other levels. So because of that, it didn't work exactly the way we yeah. thought. It wasn't out of the box. a lot of our other levels didn't yeah. work yeah. You have to compensate a lot. Sometimes you start with a base, base PBR rules, which makes sense, but you get art directed to just do something for an emotional beat or for a technical reason, just like that, which it sounds like it was both for passage. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. No Thank worries. you. Thank you. And I think there was one over here. Okay, this will be our last one. Can you guys just pass this down? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, well, thanks for having me. And my question was, what is the best thing you like about your job and worst thing you don't like? And what do you do to improve your skills? And how did you get to that point? Um, I guess my favorite thing about the job is, uh, I mean, I started here uh, at Naughty Dog after playing Uncharted 2. I had never played the first one, but my friend Greg's like, hey, you should play it. And then after I played it, I told my, my then girlfriend, now wife, Cindy, hey, I want to work on the third one. And she's like, okay, whatever. So then I, a friend of mine ended up getting a job there. He recommended me. I took, I think, two tests. First was modeling, and then they said, well, you know, modeling is pretty good, but like, do you do texturing? And I said, actually, that's what I prefer to do. So I did that, and then I got the job. Uh, but I, I love being able to just focus on my shaders. Uh, I love to model too, but I'm able to just focus and just hone my abilities as like a shader and material artist. Uh, my least favorite is Naughty Dog is in Santa Monica, and it's really expensive there. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> uh, oh, go ahead. Go, go, go. Go. If I could add to that, uh, something that's awesome about working at Naughty Dog is um, because we have such a flat structure, it's really easy for an environment artist like me to come up with an idea for something or something that might make the game better and just pitch it, and it happens most of the time if it's a good idea. So that is pretty unique in terms of uh, different type of video game companies. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. I mean, me personally, perhaps the best thing is actually, I don't usually do stuff like this, so getting to do something like this and kind of realizing that what we do, you know, does affect people and they're, you know, inspired and, you know, when you're in the, which could be the worst thing, when you're in the trenches and actually doing the work and you don't, you kind of get lost in that moment and you realize there's people out there that are waiting for this and they're, they're going to like it hopefully no matter what you do and you, you just got to trust your instinct and kind of just, it's going to come out right and because of the team and all, all, the, all the departments are amazing and, you know, just kind of, that's, that's when you kind of realize and get to finally step back and realize that it's a, it's a pretty cool project. It's yeah. like almost if you're like, is this good enough? And then you're yeah. like, oh, uh, well, if I was a fan, I'd be bummed out by that, so I should probably do a better job. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's on, in every department, everyone pushes each other. You know? Yeah. They see something and they make it better. And we all, we all adhere to it and that's, the cohesion is really nice. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think we do have just, we'll just sneak this one question in. Yeah, sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, hi. Um, I'm unfamiliar with the, uh, the flow of Pipeline at Naughty Dog, and considering how your, your games are always so beautiful and, um, you know, textures in the environments are definitely more of a character 
sometimes than the characters themselves at occasions. Um, how, how close to the deadline, the ship date, um, <laughs> do you guys find yourselves in? <laughs> I don't know. Like it, we actually, I don't know. I probably can't say stuff, but I, Sony <laughs> likes us, and we, we've been allowed to release discs to them a little bit later before, so, yeah. So we usually we work up till, I would say we get to the point where we're really happy with it, and then we go to a meeting, and then everybody, your friends, your coworkers, some random sound guys like, that texture's not very good. <laughs> and it, I, even, I even got emails the night before from our co-president, Evan, he's like, Jeremy, that texture's terrible. <laughs> so that's prior, that goes to priority number one. So we work on it until it's perfect. Pencils basically. down, basically. Pencils yeah. down. Like, yeah. Those pencils down, that's when we stop. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow, that's cool. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. And we did just have a question come in on Twitter as well, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, so Amanda is asking, she's saying, hey, Naughty Dog, do you have an additional look development stage between concept art and final CG build out? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, yeah, we actually do. Um, you know, we get, um, sometimes we get, uh, block mesh from designers before any concept is available. So we'll try different things out while talking to the concept artists and we work in tandem a lot. Um, because of that, it, um, we're able to figure things out um, in a way that might be faster than the more traditional approach. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely not a straight line of an idea, uh, then it gets designed, then it gets concepted, then it gets modeled, then it gets textured. It's, it's constantly going back yeah. and forth. Sometimes the orders are all mixed up. Yeah. Sometimes you work Sometimes on it, you get 90% yeah. and then the concept comes in and you're like, ah, oh, man, that looks better. So then you get, gotta go back. You kinda have to balance it. Yeah. it depends on every project, every level. Kinda every team has a different flow. Like these two work together a certain way. I actually worked yeah. with Ruben on City while he was doing the tower. Um, and I'm sure working with me was a lot different than working with Brian, you know, yeah. so. <laughs> Yeah, we're both awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's have another round of applause. No